Um, and now it's time uh, for our final keynote and hope folks at home can hear me and see me okay for this one. Um, we're going to hear from Lex Fafega. Now, for people who don't know Lex, he's the co-founder, lead maker of things, slash design director at Kamuzi. And I'll tell you a little bit about his day. He spends most of his day designing, building prototypes and running experiments at his London-based design studio, Kamuzi, which he co-founded with two of his closest friends back in 2013. Happy 10-year anniversary, by the way, for that one. Um, alongside his work at Kamuzi, Lex is an artist currently exploring AI's creative potential via a number of experiments working with the likes of Google, Mercedes-Benz, and the University of Edinburgh, which is obviously the best out of those three. And uh, his keynote is titled, come on Edinburgh, Adam. Um, I mean Strathclyde, you need uh, His keynote is titled, this climate does not exist in brackets yet. And this is your final opportunity to ask questions for the summit. So if you haven't asked a question, please do put them forward. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Lex Fafiga. All right, can, you, can everyone hear me? Cool, I'm the last one. Thank you for staying. I hope you've had a lovely two days at the summit and I've learned a lot. I'm gonna be very energizing, energetic. I'm gonna walk around, but apparently I've got a screen here, timer here, this here. I'm gonna try not to turn throughout my talk, but my title of my talk, Nick did a lovely introduction, but the title of my talk is This Climate Does Not Exist, in bracket, yeah, but as Nick said, I'm Alex or Lex. I've been called Lex since I was in year seven. I run a studio in London called Kamuzi. Uh, my role is simply the design director. I really hate titles. So I made up the lead maker of things because I just like making stuff and I didn't really want to have any formalities. Um, I was also a formerly uh, lecturer at the University of Arts London's Creative Computing Institute teaching computational futures and AI. And so that was like, my module of like my brainchild to sort of live in my own reality and try to convince or expose students to working with pre-trained AI models, get them to play around, make creative stuff, but also be able to engage in a level of critical thinking or this critical analysis, being able to explore the materiality of artificial intelligence. That's the way I love to describe that. But I also come from art school. I'm an art school kid. I was studied at Central St. Martins. I heard of it because Kanye West couldn't get allowed into the fashion course. So I decided to apply there and I graduated with a master's degree. Um, but yeah, I love the way how I think and the way how we work in Kamuzi is based on these four pillars. So adventure, experimentation, rigor, and this concept of building tech tools or things that essentially meet people now. I love to say that I sort of live in the world of emerging technology, taking things from zero to one, design, and also this exploration of human culture and um, behavior. And so I've been exploring AI for a very long time. This is an example of one of the projects we worked on where Mozilla asks us to sort of create the speculative provocation around this topic of responsible AI. And so this is the invisible mask. Um, Alpha red light is invisible to the human face. So you cannot necessarily see that. However, with a lot of facial recognition models or sort of tools or cameras, they use infrared to sort of scan the human face. So this is based on an academic theory that could you disrupt a facial recognition camera with infrared light? So the cap, you put it on and it emits infrared light on particular parts of your face and hopefully it disrupts the camera. However, you know, there's so much models in the world. So it was just a nice provocation that we put on MozFest in 2019. And then this is one of my favorite projects. It's called the Hip Hop Poetry Bot. I worked with it with Google AI back in 2019. And simply what I did was train a model on a bunch of hip hop lyrics that I created a Python script from and stole lyrics from Rap Genius and sort of trained it on GPT-2 actually. So this is way before GPT-4 hype. And this is way before anybody cared about generative AI. But um, this is one of the lovely projects which you can actually check out on the Google AI experiments page. But I'm here to talk about the role of AI in visualizing climate futures. I know there was a lovely um, conversation earlier when I happened to pop in and I was able to hear some of that and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I guess as a designer, somebody who creates a lot of stuff that I 
great tools to put in the public. Um, around this time, two years ago, I was actually asked by the New Rural team, who's part of the Edinburgh Futures Institute, to sort of explore this topic of climate change and AI. And so my sort of headspace on my school of thought was climate change is obviously one of the most pressing challenges of all time. And one of the challenging things we have is that it's very abstract, it's very hard, very complex for folks to be able to understand or navigate. And could we use generative AI to help us visualize narratives of these particular futures um, that also highlight the need for action and inspire us to take some action moving um, forward. You know, a lot of my headspace since, you know, this is my master's dissertation, where I began to always be interested in exploring this concept of mapping, mapping futures with AI. Um, I come from the world of what I call speculative design or design fiction, which is a world of design where you look to make products that's not got any commercial value. Their purpose is for you to engage in that ethical criticality thinking or products that sort of emphasize this ethical implication about the world around us. And I have a lovely blog post, which I'm gonna plug, which is called Future Orientated Design. You can check it out, where I kind of go into it a lot more and critique the world of speculative fiction. But this is, I'm gonna tell you a story. So I live in Woolwich, South London. This is my view from my window. I've done well for myself. Um, and this is the River Thames. In 2021, when I was moving there, I was very intrigued because there was so much at the time, flash floods in London. And, um, and, and what happened was these flash floods happened, but nobody ever spoke about it after. It was just like, flash floods happened in Stratford, flash floods happened in this area, and no one really touched on it, ever spoke about it. And for me, when I think of um, London, we have a water um, defense system, which is called the Thames Barrier. It's operational from 1982. It was created because of the Great North Sea Flood of 1953, which really messed up most of Netherlands, Belgium, and parts of the UK as well. Um, its purpose of the Thames Barrier is simply to protect London from you know, tidal floods and storm surges. It simply um, closes when the tide is high. It's been used 207, 207 times since launch. It's only meant to be used two or three times a year, but now it's like six or seven. So I've had a lovely view I've actually seen it work before. But it leads me to this next part of the story. This is NASA data that says by 2040, it sort of predicts that most of London will be under flooding. Very drastic. And for me, I wish I had a clicker because I always love to show this, that I grew up, where, my, where I grew up and where I currently live is places where I have threat of necessarily um, flooding. And this is the Thames barrier in action. So you can kind of see the immense defense that it constantly does. You've got the top part, which is um, sort of what I would call current flow of water. And then you have this bit underneath, which is simply where the Thames barrier sort of blocks out when the tide is necessarily high. But as Londoners, or me coming from London, speaking to you all here in Scotland, we rarely ever talk about what happens to London if it's going to be under flooding? This is something from a policy perspective all the way to a London resident, that conversation isn't there. And it led me to that theory of, you know, is it because climate change is very abstract that is possibly hard for us to perceive as a direct threat to ourselves? Is it because most of the times when we talk about climate change, it's always about things being set in the future, but also things happen super far away um, from us? And so I began as I was delving into this project about climate change and AI, I was thinking about what could I do as an artist or as a designer, creating a public engagement tool that can allow for us to sort of visualize um, climate change and what is the best way to do so? And so there were seven guiding principles um, throughout this project based on this particular paper that I actually had in the previous um, slide, which is public engagement with climate imaginary in a changing climate digital landscape. And the seven principles are simply, show real people, um, not stage photo ops, tell new stories, show climate causes at scale, climate impacts are very emotionally powerful, try to do your best to show local but serious climate impacts, be careful with protest imagery, because um, that seems to be one of the things in popular discourse, but also be able to understand 
your audience. And so for me as, you know, uh, as a designer, I always love to ask those questions. And one of the ways we always do this is by the how might we, or the how can we. And so the question came to me was, how can we remove the abstract from how climate features are communicated to the public? Um, and so some of those ideas was, how do we use AI to visualize scenarios? How do we increase empathy? You know, because as I mentioned, if we're so far removed from this concept of there's this future where things might look bleak, but it's far away, we're in 2023, 2040, 17 years away, I won't have to think about that. Maybe I'll be far away in some, in Mars by then or something like that. And it's like, how do you increase that empathy in order to have that deep understanding where we can remove the cognitive bias that we might necessarily have? Also, how can we be better prepared for future events when we don't know what will happen? As I mentioned, I showed NASA data. I have no clue how they came to that prediction, but we don't know if that's necessarily going to happen. But do we have to accept this uncertainty of the future? And how do we integrate this uncertainty into our thinking and planning? And then when I say public, I always use my grammar as my barometer of success because my grandma still doesn't know how to use the remote control. So she calls me all the time, David, how can you fix the remote control? That's the name she gave to me. How can you help me change the channel? If I change from HMI 1 to HMI 2, I'm a genius in tech, I'm the next Bill Gates. So for me, a lot of the parameters is always about how do I create things that necessarily my grandma could understand? And as an individual, you know, as I come from the walls of thinking about features, this is an example of the future cones. If you're not used to it, you're simply at this place of possibilities. How could we use AI to help us visualize all of these different features? And so you have your possible features, what's most likely gonna happen. You have your preferred features. What do you as an individual like for your future to be um, preferred? Like tonight, I would love to find a lovely bar in Glasgow. So if you have any suggestions, please tell me after the talk. That is my preferred feature. But my possible feature is I could just go home and sleep and fly back to London tomorrow. And you also have your probable futures and you have your plausible futures. But how do we take you on a journey? Somebody who's not been exposed to this concept of climate change and is you know, almost like, yeah, it's too far. I don't want to pay attention to it. And I was really interested in this concept of empathy. How do we use AI to help create empathy in a way or to help trigger empathy? And I was inspired by this project by MIT um, Creative Lab. I mean, MIT Media Lab, apologies. Um, where they created this project where they tried to merge or use Gantt models to sort of merge two scenarios. So you have the city of Boston, where MIT is based, and then they try to sort of merge um, Boston with a, um, with a city in Syria and sort of bring them together in order to understand how do we as human beings react to when we see these visual images? And does it trigger this aspect of empathy? Does it help us remove our cognitive bias? And could we have a different perspective on things after we've viewed that um, image? And so my headspace at the time and my dream for working with AI was how do we balance this too? How could we engage in machine learning techniques with a physics guided understanding of um, meteorology and climate? And how could we somehow predict the future? But also how could we visualize what that future looks like as well in order to make the threat of climate change more salient and more um, concrete? And I wasn't the only person who had these thoughts at the time. This is a project by Joshua Bengio's um, lab in Montreal called Miller. Um, and Joshua Bengio, for those who are not familiar, he's a very prominent AI researcher and he's a really great thinker. And this project was called The Climate Does Not Exist. And what this project was simply about was you go on the site, you type in your address, and then what it does is it has a Gantt model which simply tries to create a sort of a mask on the image. So you have three scenarios. So you have flooded, wildfire, and smog. So these images are not necessarily real. They are renderings of particular locations across the world. Um, and you can see the examples of smog and those examples of flooding at the time. Um, and then you have the work by the new real team where we're fortunate to be one of the sort of artists who happened to work on this particular project where, you know, for me, I was really interested in 
you know, looking at an artistic interrogation of the world around us and sort of this convergence of, um, of just different elements and matters. And so this is an example of meant to be a street where it's flooded. And then this was just a, an example of me using the Bintgan model of my council estate where I grew up in South London and this conversion of water and sea. And so you have the artistic lens um, to it. And at the time, it was actually with these things very difficult to actually um, interrogate and do these things. And so that leads me to the next step, which is actually about as, you know, at the same time I'm working on these projects, was when Dao E was released, Stable Diffusion, and the journey. And so now that technical challenge of originally, how do you, if you wanted to visualize images, how could you get, how do you get flooding to be, you know, to be visualized from a, from a Gantt model in a way that's very realistic and not in a way that it looks too fake. And now we have this level of sophistication. So there was an opportunity where the technical challenge has been addressed. And there's an opportunity now where we can further move forward with public engagement. I'm just gonna play this video from TikTok, which um, shows, you know, where people have tried to possibly um, explore um, these things. I'm just gonna play it right this now. This is what artificial intelligence thinks New York City could look like by 2100 in the worst case climate scenario. Midjourney, an AI tool made photo predictions of what cities in the future could look like if nothing is done to mitigate the effects of climate change. For instance, this is Paris. And this is what Los Angeles could look like. Of course, these are hypotheticals, but they serve an important purpose of visualizing why we need environmental protections. The images generated in collaboration with U-Switch and Oxford University's Net Zero Initiative comes just in time for COP27. Right now, world leaders are meeting in Egypt to talk about the future of climate action. Experts are saying that countries are nowhere near close to meeting targets and commitments. These photos serve as a warning. Do you think that AI-generated photos are an accurate prediction of our cities by 2100? So I think for me as a person, as much as I enjoy these videos, is also trying to be very careful of very being alarmist or trying to burden folks with all these type of information when it's a future we don't know. We know it's very likely to happen, but we have a concept of how these things may happen. But how do you communicate to folks about hey, this is the future that's gonna happen, this is how it looks like, but here are the changes and the things that you can necessarily do. And so some of the explorations of some of the work I'm trying to do now around this topic of climate change and AI, as we you know, have achieved at least the technical challenge of how do we get these images come to life due to the you know, sophisticated tools that we have now been introduced to the market, to the industry. But how do we work with users or individuals to sort of engage in this world of like choice nubs where folks can see the sort of visual impact of their personal choices. You know, for example, if you were to, you know, like, you know, Richard and I took a train up to Glasgow, which is more efficient. However, it's actually way more expensive than flying to Glasgow, which is sad, you know, but how could we be able to show folks like based on these visual change or based on your actions, these are the visual changes, these are the, the ways that how you can take actions. But also one of the key things about the work I'm doing is not to put the burden on residents in London, but actually more on the policymakers. Because that's an area of you know, challenge or discourse, should I say, where there isn't a conversation about what does the future of London actually look like or feel like in a sort of, what I, you know, in a, in a world impacted by um, climate change. But I've got one minute left and I'm gonna say thank you. I have 10, 11 minutes for questions. So if you do have any questions, please do ask. I don't know where, they come off on your iPad and then. Okay, thank you everyone. Lex Fafega everyone, thanks so much for that Lex. And yeah, I'm basically coming up here to ask you a few questions. I'm going to quiz you silly. Um, please do submit any questions you have for us, and I'll get them to Lex. We've got so far one question from the audience. Come on, guys. Come on. Um, so I'll ask you some of my own questions, Lex, which is, um, over the past couple of days, we've been talking about like AI and public perception. And I wonder, how effective do you think 
the work that you're doing and art in general is as a communication tool when it comes to really informing, I guess, the public on current issues, but also different tech trends? It's a, it's a very good, um, I think when I talk about that blog post, uh, featured, featured, was it, creature-orientated design. Yeah. And one of the things when I wrote in that blog, in my thesis was this critique of, a lot of the times, the conversation about the future or the world that we're living in it's very much kept in spaces like this. And this isn't a critique to all of us here. I think we're all amazing, lovely people. But there's an opportunity where we can go further. And that's why I always use my grandma as that barometer because my grandmother still has no clue what I do. I've tried to explain to her many times. She just says, well done, well done, well done. I'm proud, I'm proud, you know? But there's the opportunity where it's like, how do you get much more closer to the grassroots, to outside of what I might call an intellectual conversation and be able to communicate to folks about you know the future of this world you know i think maybe chat gpt probably i've seen folks who don't work in tech who have said oh my god chat gpt is changing my mind da, 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 da. and it's like okay cool maybe this is the first time that folks are beginning to have an understanding of what ai could do but also how i guess with art for me is always about going to the communities going to the groups going to places where we're not, we're not having an intellectual conversation because mm -hmm. A, I don't even understand that myself half of the time. Yeah. So how can we have it where it's just, look, this is the world. The world mm -hmm. is changing. What's your opinions? What's your thought processes on that? And with every project that we've done regarding with AI and looking at that at the public, that's always the question we always ask. What's your thoughts? What's your perspective? Mm -hmm. The whole purpose is to constantly expose folks to this information and hopefully they have their own sort of agency and understanding and autonomy of where their life should be sort of changed by um, AI. Mm -hmm. How do you measure success in your line of work? Is there a particular thing that you look out for or is there one killer thing where you go, oh, I've smashed it. I've absolutely like, you know, communicated what I want you to with my work. It's a combination of two. I think when I look at some of those, when I look at the Invisible Mask, that was a project where we was inspired about what was going on in the world at the time. And that was more looking at in Hong Kong, where there was protests going on, and um, and folks, you know, folks who were protesting um, were very sort of anxious about the cameras around them, and so they were literally you watch videos where people were literally smashing cameras down, or we talk about in London where there was the development of King's Cross, where mm -hmm. they actually introduced facial recognition cameras, yeah. but didn't actually let. Permission, they didn't let no one knew. No one knows, sorry, should yeah. I say. And it was this insidious thing. And so we were like, in a digital realm, we have GDPR, which hopefully tries to protect ourselves. But what actually happens in the real world? How do we opt out of being surveilled? You know, I'm a black guy, I'm six foot four. You know, if you don't meet me, people are gonna be scared sometimes. So it's like, <laughs> even for me, how do I exist in a world where I'm not surveilled? I've got my agency, I've got my autonomy. So the cap was a response to that topic. And I guess what Seth said at that time was, could we educate people what we were trying to do? Because we were very scared about how we present this to the audience, especially what was going on in the world at the time. It was like, you know, people were saying to us, yeah, you should do this, you should develop this further, you should turn this. And we were like, no, we just want to have a conversation about agency and autonomy mm -hmm. in um, the world that we live at. So for me, every time it is about, um, one person, someone who's not exposed to this world, could they have necessarily a new knowledge or a new mm. understanding where they've gone away and they can probably share it with somebody else mm. um, in the future about things. We are doing a lot more work on AI. We are working on the film, um, which literally looks at algorithms and the flaws of algorithms and stuff like that. And the whole purpose once again was, what is the best way to have, how can we, show folks these ethical implications of these technologies or this world that they exist in, but also in a way where it's like digestible mm -hmm. and they can understand. And it's like, okay, maybe film is one of those places that mm -hmm. we can explore. So that is some yeah. of the stuff that we, we are help with doing. Understanding. Yeah. Okay, let's go to some of the questions now because quite a few have come in. Um, so this question is from Paul and he says, at what point do we question using AI imagery to manipulate emotions like empathy? Would you agree that all AI imagery needs to be labelled as such, that we should not support the use of dark patterns to achieve a good? Do you believe that the ends justify the means? No, I agree with that. I definitely, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in the past about chatbots 
and chatbot interactions. And one of the things we were looking at was where this chatbot doesn't refer to itself as like it, it refers to itself by name. So it doesn't mm -hmm. refer to itself as I, it's like, I am a chatbot. Uh, my, my name is this, this provides the, 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 the. So I'm very big on that ethical side of making it clear that this isn't real, this is generated and making that very obvious for someone to see and for you to maybe implement more friction in that, in that sort of interaction process. So someone has an agency once again to be able to go in this journey, but they've done it through personal choice, not by the choice of the designer, should I say. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, thanks. Um, I think this is a really good question there, which is, um, there have been previous discussions today and yesterday about how AI, uh, how generative AI art could potentially uh, ruin human creativity. As an artist who uses generative AI in his artworks, what's your take on this? So where my sort of realm of stuff comes in um, was always about, and a lot of the work I did with Google was, was kind of, by the time I finished my master's, I was very interested in possibly doing a PhD. And the area was looking at AI human co-creation. And my whole headspace is more about how can these tools, almost my dream, and I think I showed it in one of the slides where I had like a glove and I didn't touch on the glove. But the original idea of the hip hop poetry book was a rap glove. And we were literally like, how do we, Oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Well, you've got this glove here. This is like a 3D, quick 3D sketch of the glove. But the whole idea was that as a performer, you could perform in front of an audience, like me speaking now, and I press a button and I say something, but the sort of, you have a teleprompter right in front of you, maybe right here, and it sort of co-creates with you as you engage. So for me, I've always been big on co-creation mm. rather than this concept of replacement mm -hmm. because as me as somebody who's speaking sometimes for folks speaking is hard it's yeah, really yeah. hard like and putting the right words together to say after to make sense to an audience could be pretty challenging mm -hmm. so a lot of my headspace is more about co-creation rather than replacement of human creativity and i think right now when i see a lot of the alarmist tweets on like ai is going to replace this duh, 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 like i just feel sick inside because i'm like this is not this is like my worst nightmare in a way yeah. but my whole Dream is really about co-creation. I really love the way how, for example, Adobe uh, recently had rolled out a bunch of generative AI tools, which can kind of embed into anyone's workflow and it can just show up in Photoshop, in Illustrator, and it's very seamless. It isn't like this. And they have a really good blog actually about, um, I think it's called like Responsible Innovation in the world of AI. If anybody's interested in reading it, they literally um, released it last week and it's a really good blog about how can we be responsible as we roll out these tools, um, these new exciting tools. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it brings me on to like one of my personal questions for you, which was about, um, you know, you've utilised tech in the creation of your art for many years now. But do you think that actually, given recent developments, talking the last few weeks now, that actually AI might start taking more, might actually pick up the brush or might be, you know, the person that starts to take charge or maybe more of a artistic creative lead. And then you've got to go, hold on, what are you doing? This is my turf. What do you, what do you say to that? It's an interesting one, right? Because I feel like everything is, is, is always, creativity is always built on context. It's context dependent. I think, um, and the machine learning model has no clue what the heck it's doing. It doesn't know what, mm. doesn't know how the audience is going to take it. Where for me as a speaker, I know I'm coming here to share a perspective. I know that I have an energy, I have a context. I want to present something to the world and I want the world to be convinced by what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And they go away with that. And I think there's that human sort of element here, mm -hmm. which we have and still in control. I hate the prompt approach to what we have with generative AI now where you, it requires somebody to be really good at writing words in order to trigger this response. And I'm like, yeah. how do we have, like I mentioned with Adobe or Photoshop, how do we have some sort of co-assistant approach? But it's the interaction model isn't by typing a prompt because that also limits folks in terms of the level of English knowledge you have or the way of sure. grammar, da -da 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 -da. Uh -huh. but how can it be a bit more, what I say, more natural in a way, in that context. So, and I just want to ask you this last question, which is like a burning one, I guess, of, of mine and what we've been talking about with several people the last couple of days now, which is what's your opinion on the AR discourse uh, online where humans don't get the sufficient credit for the art that's being used to create generative AI images? 
So that's an area of debate that has been there since way before you had these tools that now anybody could, you know, go into discourse and use Midjourney and generate an image. And this has been an issue from some of the earlier artists who have worked with AI and they have gone up the way, had GPUs, they've trained their own models, they've created their own art pieces. And then their struggle was a newspaper article would say AI created tool, AI created this artwork, but not necessarily acknowledge the author of the piece. And I think there is a big, massive challenge there um, especially, you know, about credit, copyright, you know, even with the hip hop poetry, but why I joked to mention I took lyrics from the internet, there was a big fear about, you know, what happens if you create this tool and you launch this to the market and a music artist says, where did you train this from? How do we get permission from artists and those things? And so with the hip hop poetry, but if you go now to the site, what you see is a video of me saying, hey folks, please send your lyrics. I'm coming to you as the public for you to sort of be part of this journey where we collectively create this AI tool that works really well, but it's a collective relationship. And I think there's still a lot more work that needs to be done in the way of intellectual property and the internet age where it's so hard to mm. basically track, you know, where's, you know, if as an artist, where's my art been yeah, and yeah. those particular things. But I think there needs to be a way more discourse yeah. on that. Ladies and gents, Lex Figa. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Lex. Mm -hmm. awesome.